Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm here with the man, Alex Shalinsky. Uh, we actually just connected this weekend. I've known him for a while. I've been following his work. Uh, he is like one of the, the best people I know that I've actually learned a lot of tips from and most authentic in sales. So I wanted to kind of cover in this like episode, this Facebook Live, uh, his psychology, his framework behind sales, because I really resonate with it. And um, it's funny, a lot of people don't think that like, you know, with podcasting, like you have to have some scale skills, but if you actually want to make podcasting a business, like I know some people who they just use their podcast to interview CEOs and, and big like decision makers and their sales skills involved in that. Or if you just talk, if you just want to sell to your listeners, their sales skills involved in that. So I'm pretty excited to kind of expose some of Alex's like ideas here. So Alex, can you uh, kind of share if people don't know who you are? Uh, while you're awesome and what you do. Yeah, awesome. I appreciate you, Daxi. I appreciate uh, being here. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited uh, to share some insights today and hopefully help you make the biggest impact possible and some money. That's the idea. Uh, so my background, really briefly, uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, someone who is absolutely fascinated by psychology. That's what I went to school for. Uh, love human connection and the way that people think and are persuaded by each other. Um, and I was always fascinated by that. Uh, I decided not to go into the psychology route for a story for a different time um, and ended up kind of just falling into the marketing business and life. Um, did it very successfully for a certain amount of time until I realized my passion was in helping coaching other people, entrepreneurs in general, marketers more specifically, uh, on how to sell and price and utilize their services, creating unique mechanisms, their intellectual property, creating irresistible offers. Um, that ultimately became my passion. Um, in the last uh, couple years, I've run Prospecting On Demand, which is my uh, business. It's not my agency. Uh, my agency is Sky Social Media, but it's my coaching business specifically for marketers. Uh, I've helped 120 agency owners hit six figures in the last year alone. So about 15 or so of those have hit seven figures. Uh, the models that I share with you here today are the exact models I'm going to share with people that invest and work with me. The difference, obviously, is accountability and mentorship, uh, but I want to give you the insight. So if you're listening to this podcast or watching live, with us on Facebook, don't be among the 99% that are just going to listen to this and let it go in it one ear and out the other. Implement what I'm asking you to do, and I guarantee you will message me in the next coming seven days and say, Whoa, consistent basis. And if you just implement, it will happen for you too. Yeah, and I can attest like some of the stuff I've learned, I heard from like, some of your interviews, like one with Andrew, like it's in our SOPs now, like a lot of stuff you said. So, oh. dude, uh, can you what kind of agencies do you work with? Just so people have some context. Yeah, really any agency. Um, I have experience with basically every single one, um, every niche uh, essentially. So, real estate, you know, mortgage, uh, chiropractors, doctors, dentists. We've done all of those agency models. Um, we've done some different types of agency models, whether it's PPC, like offering advertising. from people that worked in web design up to uh, individual unique local businesses, large companies to e-commerce, physical products, to info products, coaching products to everything in between. Um, we have experience with almost every single type of uh, growth would be unique. It's, it's always fun for me when someone comes to me with something that's new uh, because I've done it so many, so many times um, that it's a, a unique perspective when it's, hey, that's interesting. We haven't thought about that before. So most of the time, you know, anyone that's any entrepreneur selling an online info product, digital product, uh, advertising product, we work with. Yeah. Yeah. Ultavice says implementation is key. Yes, guys. Um, cool. So actually, I want to, before we dive into like your frameworks and your like uh, your unique you know mechanisms, um, can we talk about how, cause I heard you share this on Jeff's uh, live a long time ago, um, how like you started interviewing for sports teams and then that helped you kind of develop your sales skills just intuitively. Yeah. So I used to work for the Miami Dolphins and the UFC and um, I didn't go to school to become a journalist, but I'm a huge, huge sports fan. And I really wanted to make this happen after I graduated college cause I was working in marketing a little bit, but I didn't expect actually that it would become a career. It just wasn't something that I foresaw. Um, but I do, I did know that at that time I was willing to do hustle and the hustle that I was willing to do 
list to do. Um, so I got the opportunity to do some work for the Dolphins in the UFC, um, then started creating new opportunities to do coach, head coach interviews, uh, championship fighter interviews. Uh, and it was amazing. It was really, really an incredible experience. But I used to have to transcribe um, the interviews, which was the worst part of my job by far. They didn't have Rev.com at the time. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I I like, there's technology for that now. I wish. There's I wish even- that back then. Um, there's Temi yeah. Aqua, which is an automated one, which I was desperate. There's for even that. a there's even a better one, Otter.ai, which is like way cheaper. It's like 0.001 cents. I'm gonna check that out. I use. Um, so the funniest yeah. thing for me, you'll you'll die laughing on this. Back in the day, the only thing that was new was Google Voice recognition. Out so bad, they obviously half the half the words were wrong. So I used to have to literally transcribe it myself. And while transcribing, it forced me to listen to the questions I was asking, which, as you can imagine, was cringeworthy. Um, and the responses were always crap. The literally the worst responses because they've heard that question seven times that day already, right? They do media uh, outlets in a certain amount of time frame, so they. Get different and more unique questions, which would lead to better and more unique responses. The part that I didn't expect was that other companies that were promoting specifically in the UFC fighters wanted to have interviews with me because I was asking unique questions like Reebok, for example, they're promoting at the time, the champion, Anthony Pettis, they sent me over his shoes for free. I did an hour long interview uh, with the champion asking him questions about psychology and the way human emotions are in fighting. And it was totally different and a unique experience. And Anthony really appreciated it. Obviously, I love doing it. It was amazing. Reebok appreciated it. Um, and it made me understand the importance of reflection to listen to yourself and really understand uh, where you're going. Speaking for me in general, like communicating with people, that was always something that I was uh, very good at naturally. Um, but it, there's something to be good at naturally. And then honing that skill is something that's critical. And honing that skill came from literally doing interviews and listening back to how shitty those questions were. So when I went into sales, it was just natural for me to automatically listen back to the call. Thank God I didn't have to transcribe those. <laughs> But I had to listen to them and realize, why Why did this go so wrong? So I'll give you the metaphor here, and it's really powerful. I like to close my eyes on this one. But sales for me is basically you're in a dark forest. You're holding the lead's hand when you start the conversation. And every single question you ask, there's the opportunity for them to go in 500 different directions, right? And as you're holding their hand, what point did you let go of their hand? Now, the goal of sales is to walk through the entire forest hand holding, and they've paid you, right? That's the idea. But a lot question you asked or the way that in which you asked the question, there's so many pieces of it that kind of get lost. So when you listen back to these calls, you can quickly identify where you felt the piece of the puzzle was missed out on, and then you fix it and optimize it for the next call. And that's the importance of grounding yourself in numbers, understanding how to reflect on your own sales calls and really become more efficient in sharpening your tools rather than just, I'm not good at sales. That doesn't help anyone. Yeah. So for someone who's like a newbie, um, and what's up, Lisa? She says hi. Uh, for someone who's, if you guys are on live, give me hashtag live. Uh, for someone who's like a newbie and like they are, think back to yourself, you know, when you first started doing these sales calls, um, what was some things that you would do differently, you know, that would give you the most impact from the start? Um, and you can, you can, if you want, so you can dive into your frameworks or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. So that's a, such a great question. Like, what would I do if I could go back and I was just getting started or what would I recommend to someone that is just getting started? Um, I think what I would do if I were to go back would to stop trying to have a script. That was like a big thing for me back then that I wanted to have a script, but it took away from my natural communication ability. Um, the problem with sales is that there's a massive myth sales is. Is that really how you define sales in your mind? It's crazy how many people have literally defined it that way. And then when I position them and say, do you feel like sales is meant to trick someone? They're like, no, 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 I shouldn't. But everything that they've created, all the mindset. I think the car salesman right? type mentality, yeah. That's exactly it, right? They created the entire process around their brain focused on that sales is some negative thing. It's like the most important qualifier, most important skill that any entrepreneur or human being could have. Sales is telling your parents at 18 years old that you're gonna go out with this girl and there's a reason that you should be able to do that, right? Like that's sales also. Sales is communicating with you know a, an older mentor of yours and getting them to agree to do something with you that they don't wanna spend their time on. It's, everything is sales in life. Anything that's persuasive is sales, but it's not in a negative way. The negative way is what 
creates con artistry. It's what creates negative impact. It's what creates people taking advantage of someone else because they feel that they're better than them. That's not what sales is. Sales is helping people. Sales is making a difference for people. I knew that from day one, and yet everything I did was taking action from that mindset that sales was taking advantage of people. And that would be the biggest thing I would have changed, understanding really what sales was. Because um, I felt like I was conniving people when I was back in the day, like saying things that maybe I couldn't deliver um, and feeling like I was an imposter. And then I only, only to recognize that feeling like an imposter is coming from a place of integrity. It means that, the reason you feel like an imposter is because you're concerned that what you're offering them is not something you can actually deliver. That's a good thing. Rather than, ah, I don't give a shit about them. I'll just sell them, make my money. And if they don't get the result, fuck them, right? Like that's not the model. That's not how it's done. If you want to be successful in sales, pretend that you're the person being sold. What would that be required of you? What would What's at stake? Is their family at stake? Is their rent at stake? Is their food at stake? Is their lives at stake? What is really at stake here? Like understand the circumstances around this situation. One thing that I really would have changed for sure if I could have gone back to the beginning of my sales conversations, if I would have removed scripts completely. I used to teach, even up to like two years ago, I used to teach people like in a script, like say this exact sentence, do it in this exact way. It's not about that. It's understanding the the baseline. And, and we can talk about some of the frameworks that I have now and just really understanding human psychology, really understanding the, the formats and the baselines of what sales are and realizing that frameworks matter, not scripts. So I'll, I'll break down two really important ones um, that I think will clarify for everyone exactly what needs to happen to be successful in sales. So the first one is understanding the three components to sales. Three components are number one, the words that you say, obviously, then number two is the tonality in which you say them. This is critically important to understand the difference between the words that you say and how you say them. It's very different. If you don't have passion in sales, you're not going to create opportunity. Same thing in video audits also, right? I do a lot of video audit reviews and the person's like, hi, I'm Daxi and I'm gonna offer you. It's like, I don't wanna watch 10 more seconds of this video. You're not capturing my attention. You're not interested in this. There's no passion behind this. Why should I even be interested in you, right? So number one is the words that you say, number two is the tonality, and number three is where most people just completely lose it, and that is the visual aspect. Most people that are doing sales on phones really miss out because if you don't have anything visual to attach to this process, you're completely disregarding 33.33333% of sales right off the bat, right? So those are the three main components of sales. Understand those pieces. The next piece is understanding the, the PAC framework. Now, this is a really powerful methodology it's highly unlikely that you've heard of it, but if you implement what I'm gonna tell you, it's not gonna just help you in sales, it's gonna help you in your life in general altogether. So the PAC model is actually a transactional analysis theory, a psychoanalytic theory from 1950s. People, when they hear the word psychoanalysis, they likely think of Sigmund Freud, probably the most famous uh, psychoanalyst of all time. Uh, Eric Byrne, who was a uh, similar psychoanalysis um, person, he not only created transactional analysis, but he didn't create it for sales, he created it for the model of how to communicate with human beings in general. And it's a really, really powerful methodology that you can read up on and learn about, but I'll give you kind of the breakdown and how I've converted it strictly into sales. So what he posited was that there's three people you speak to, three ego states that you speak to in one conversation. So for Daxi, for myself, for your parents, for your leads, for your friends, for your clients, there's three people you're speaking to all at once. And this is the PAC framework, the parent, the adult, and the child. So the parent, the parent thinks in a skeptical format, right? Skepticism comes from security, from a sense of I need to protect myself, my family, my investments, my time, et cetera. Those are really important to these people, right? So. Oh no, we lost. Oh, you dropped out for a second. Okay, you're back. We're back. Yeah. So we're talking yeah. about how parents, right? How we overcome skepticism in a framework where the parent is really concerned about being secure with their time, investments, et cetera. So the way you overcome skepticism is with proof, right? Like here's a person just like you that had the same circumstances that achieved X, Y, and Z. It's very, very hard for someone to see proof in front of their face and disregard it. That's the easiest way for people to overcome skepticism. It doesn't mean that people won't be skeptical, skeptical of the results. They still could be. That's why it's only one third of the process. But this right here, just alone, parent, equals skepticism equals proof. Very, very simple. If you show them proof, it makes it 
easier to overcome skepticism. And what's the next stage? This is the adult process. The adults think in a logical frame, right? Adults think in a logical framework. This is really powerful. How do you overcome someone that thinks in a logical framework? Well, you don't tell them random stuff. You don't show them a million puzzle pieces. You show them a path, a paint by the numbers approach, a proven process and system. This is where your IP or intellectual property, your specific model, the thing that makes you unique is so critically important because it's a psychological way to tell someone that I'm not the same as the sea of people that you've spoken to. This is my model, my proven process and system, the process that's going to work for you that I just showed you work for X, Y, and Z person just like you. And it works because it's proven. Here's how. Step one, step two equals step three. That's it. Simplify the model. That's the key. That's how you put those two and two together. Now, C is the easiest one for everyone to understand. And this is the child format. Child and children think with their big picture, the, the idea of forgetting all obstacles. Children do not think of obstacles. They do not think of things that will get in their way. They just think of the things that they want. What do most people want? Now, in my specific example, in my niche, most people, Daxi, as I'd expect you'd see, want time and financial freedom and to be successful. Now, as we discussed previously, Daxi, when we met, one of the big obstacles there is everyone has ambiguity on that. It's not your job in those sales conversations to create clarity on it, although it's valuable to do so. Just the key is understanding what that ambiguous term is, what that childlike dream is. Most people want to have time to spend with their family and do what they want to do with their time and money to do what they want to do with their money. Now, if you can define that more clearly and specify it more clearly, you will be more successful in sales. But just understanding that alone and telling them that you're going to bring them to that spot, like you want to have the you know Corvette, we can get you there. Like we can make it happen through this proven process and system, just like we did it already for Michelle and Chris and Lisa, right? That's the model of PAC. If you do this in everything that you do in your life and you frame out the PAC, you're gonna really be successful. Every time I write a post, every time I do a video, every time I do um, a mastermind, I'm always thinking in PAC. How do I start with parent, adult, and child? What do I do? And it can be CAP, it can be APC. It doesn't matter the method in which you do it. It just matters that you touch on all pieces of it. And that's really the key to being successful in a framework of sales. That's awesome. The PE, I, I took a lot of notes here, dude. So it's sweet. Um, you kind of touched on the, the three components. Um, how do you kind of integrate the visual component? So what I do um, for a visual component is 99% of my sales are on Zoom without question. 99% um, of my sales are on Zoom. I don't really do any sales calls at this. I won't say none, but very few calls I do over the phone only. Um, and if I do something over the phone only, I have a pitch deck that I've recorded and I send it to them without the investment requirement, get on the call, make sure they watch the video, ask them if they have any questions and then, and then offer them the investment. Um, so that's what I would do if, if you don't have the ability to get them on zoom, cause that is sometimes difficult for some people. Um, but yeah, I use a pitch deck. I just use a pitch deck. I show some things off and it's just a no brainer for people to work with me. When they look at everything and they see the proof, they see the results, they understand the childlike dream of where we're taking them. They understand the proven process and system. It's just a no brainer. Every time that we go to the end of the call, it's like, okay, like I have to do this, right? That's the idea. That's what I'm looking for. That's how I use the visual component. So other than the scripting, like what was your biggest struggle that you first kind of encountered? Uh, who, who, who was your mentor, by the way, in sales? Like who did you learn a lot no. from? There was no mentor in sales uh, specifically when I started um, because sales was something that was really natural for me. Just cu human communication was really natural for me. I'll tell you something that kind of spurred it and then I'll tell you a couple books that really helped because that would be my mentorship at that time. Um, when, I, when I left college, uh, circumstances happened that rec made me recognize I'm not going to go get a PhD, which was at the time like de debilitating to me. That was something that I wanted to do for a really, really long time and it just didn't happen um, for circumstances outside of my control. Um, and I made that choice not to do it. And then I kind of just fell back to what I knew as a, as a fan of sports, I would just go into this opportunity. As a kid, and I'm sure you've heard this, Daxi, a lot, you know, like, oh, you can do anything, Alex. You're smart enough to accomplish anything. You could do it all. Like, I'm like, no, I can't fly off a roof. Like, I can't do that. No matter how much I want to, I can't make it happen. Like, no matter how bad I want to be an astronaut, the chances of being an astronaut is unlikely. Um, no matter how much I want to work for ESPN, it's unlikely. But the truth was, is I was just skeptic of that consistent, uh, you know, 
hearing that 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 note all the time from everyone you you work you listen to uh love family members from you know five years old up to 25 and um i just started right like i i believed in that so I wanted to become a Dolphins media member. I literally called the Dolphins 60 days in a row every single day, got rejected every single day until the day that they're like, yeah, come in on Sunday. We'll bring you in. They had a, they had a, you know, a requirement for me to go to an event um, to do some media that no one else wanted to do, which was great. It was a media to feeding the homeless for Dolphins players, which I was all about. And then I was a Dolphins media member. And for the first time in my life, I really felt Daxi like, wow, I really can't do anything I want. Like, I could do anything I want if I just put my mind to it. And I never believed that. I never believed it. And it's such a, it's such a stupid thing for me not to have believed, but because nothing ever happened to me that made me feel that way, I just never believed it. From that day on, I was committed 100% to doing whatever I wanted to do and I would make it happen. Um, I knew sales was something I was already good at, but I was still struggling um, kind of putting the pieces together. So I read Spin Selling, which was great, Pitch Anything by Oren Klopf, probably the single most influential book I read regarding sales by itself. Um, and then not necessarily just a scaling book, uh, not, sorry, I kind of just killed the, the punchline there, but anyways, not just a selling book, a scaling book called Scaling Up. The funny thing about Scaling Up is like, it's literally a textbook for college, but it's so impactful and incredibly valuable for entrepreneurs. Um, I'd strongly advise it. So those were like my three mentors um, for sales. And of course, of course, of course, for our work week and Tim Ferriss, pretty common. I have Tools of Titans up here. I love that book, it's great. Um, so yeah, those those would probably be my main mentors for sales, those books at that time. Gotcha, that tenacity, awesome. Um, Leslie says, hey, Daxi, hey, Alex. Hey, What's so that? I'm curious, what, like, in the, so you've helped 120 people, you know, reach six figures in their agency. What do you think is the biggest, like, struggle that they, you see they face? And like, how did you help them overcome it? It's all the, mindset. The mindset, okay. It's all mindset. So, so like, this is my assumption. I don't have the numbers listed out. It's ironic that you mentioned this, Daxi. So I just want to talk about one thing and then I'll dive in. Um, one of the things that I, I really want to be, like one of my goals is that I want to be happy, right? I think a lot of people don't talk about that, but specifying what happy means is really hard. It's super subjective. Like sometimes you want you like, you don't even know if you feel happy, right? Like you just don't even know. But that's like a specific goal. I just want to be happy. Like I want to enjoy what I do. Right. So I feel very comfortable and happy right now. And I'm trying to identify like quickly and like understand what makes me happy. What makes me happy is removing anxiety and stress. How do I remove anxiety and stress? Having clarity. How do I have clarity? By removing ambiguity. How do I remove ambiguity? By tracking everything. How do I track everything? By systemizing everything. How do I systemize everything? By having a strategy. You see how this all works backwards? This is how I do everything in my life. It might sound absolutely insane, but it's really ultimately to make me feel successful and happy. Money does not do it for me. It's just not. I made a lot of money. I'm extremely grateful for that. I'm extremely proud of that, but it doesn't just make you happy. It does not remove anxiety or stress, right? It doesn't. It just simply does not. So. I try to express to everyone that I work with like the importance of having clarity. And I think most people that I work with simply do not have clarity. So where this all came down to is reflection, right? Reflection is really my key to happiness because reflecting on, on what I'm doing in the last week, month, year, quarter, et cetera, allows me to identify what we can do to optimize moving forward. I don't have expectations that I'm gonna be perfect. I don't have expectations my clients are gonna be perfect. So it's funny you mentioned this because literally yesterday we started on the first quarter uh, success diagram for POD and POD Elite, which is putting all the clients we have in and ones that we've deemed as successful and ones that we've deemed unsuccessful for whatever reason and what the characteristics were so we can learn from that. And it's very funny you just mentioned that because we literally started on it yesterday. And I would say the majority of people that are successful, it wasn't about information that they were missing. Is information important? Sure. Like if you've never heard the PAC model, is that going to help you? Of course. If you haven't understood how to do prospecting effectively and you learn from me, is that going to help you? Of course. There's no doubt about it. The truth is though, most people really, really struggle not due to information. In fact, it's the opposite. Most people have information overload. It's like they, they take in so much information and do nothing with it. Like I said at the beginning of this, 99% of people are going to watch this and not do anything. They're just not. They're just not going to do anything because they're going to go watch another video with like Jeff Miller or Andrew or anyone else and then not do anything with that also. And then be like, why didn't I make money this month? 
hey, my friend, newsflash, because you're doing a bunch of dumb shit and not actually writing anything down or doing anything with it, right? So I'm on information fast right now, like heavy information fast. I'm not taking in any intel right now. All I'm doing is learning from the past quarter. I'm about to post literally in two days from now, I'm about to finish my information fast and post information fast over what should I be learning and listening to? And I'm gonna get 500 comments, right? About these are the things I should do. And I'm probably gonna take a couple of them and then information fast again because I can't take all of it in. I, I can't, it's not possible. And what what if what happens if I do take it all in Daxi? I end up becoming stressed and anxious and frustrated, right? And I remove what my ultimate goal is, which is being happy. So it kind of breaks the barriers here. So the people that have had the most success understand really what their core problem is. People wanna talk about the service level problems, like, oh, I suck at prospecting, or I suck at sales, or I suck at being an entrepreneur. The problem is, is you probably suck uh, at mindset. You probably suck at implementing. You probably suck at human systems. So one of the big things that I've been focusing on recently, and a lot of my content's gonna move towards that, is human systems. How to become more efficient, more productive, clarity over ambiguity, grounding yourself in numbers, avoiding mental struggles and hurdles, stop making um, anthills uh, or molehills into mountains, right? Like these are some of the massive, massive thought processes I have, right? Like. I think of it like an iceberg. You only see the tip, right? You only see the tip and that's them speaking out to existence. Like I'm struggling, Daxi. What's under that iceberg is all this shit piled up from years and years of not implementing, beating themselves over the head with because they're frustrated and just not feeling like they're good enough. And that's because they never identified in any way what goals are, what they're trying to work to, how they're making progress. Like that's my goal. So the people that have had success, really implement my human systems, my understanding of how to use a calendar, of how to be more productive, of how to ground yourself in numbers, of how to overcome the mindset obstacles. That doesn't mean that the sales training import box isn't important or all that stuff is very important, no doubt, for sure. But really it comes down to being effective yourself, being efficient yourself and understanding where you're going, where you were and where what the obstacle was to stop you from where you wanna go. That, that's it, if we get those things clarified, then we'll be a lot more successful. So I'm always working towards that. I'm always working towards how to help people overcome overwhelm and lack of clarity. Those are really the two major things. Yeah, I definitely feel you on the information overload. Like that's one of the biggest things I've learned this year from, from Steve Larson, who I learned a lot from. Uh, he calls it just in time learning. You know, you don't need to read all these books and stuff. Like it's just, you only learn for the next step. Like anything that exactly. you're learning, you're not implementing now, like there's no point of learning it. It's just like, I love it. Activity. Uh, actually there. Um, so I'll throw one thing out at you, right? On, on yeah. answering that. So like I said, Tools of Titans, this is a good book for, for exactly that model, right? So like if I want to just have a spark of inspiration in my brain and I just want a small snippet, Tools of Titans is a great book for that, right? Because literally it's just small snippets of Tim Ferriss's podcast. And I can learn one thing in there and then I can go implement it rather than gathering all this intel and then my mind is cluttered with a bunch of shit that I don't remember. And that doesn't help in any way because it, in, in fact, it causes the adverse effect, right? It's, it's a point of diminishing returns where you're like, I brought in all this and now I don't know what to take action on and I forgot some of the important stuff. I'm mixing it in together. I'm getting conflicting advice. It's it kills people. It's, it literally cripples them. So when I tell people that I'm on information fast, they don't, they don't, can't fathom it. They're like, how's that possible? You're so smart. You do all this stuff. You coach people. How can you not be learning? I'm like, trust me, I have a shitload of things that I want to watch when the time is right, but I'm on information fast because I'm trying to implement right now and then I'll come back to it. That's my that. that. There's two things I want to, I want to touch on here that you talked about. Um, I love the human systems. Like that's such a, it's very, very like, important for people to understand that. But like one is uh, reflection. How are you kind of like integrating that to actually get like good feedback and like, you know, move forward? Love that, man. Yeah. So reflection is the hardest and most powerful thing to do in life, not in business, in life. I'm going to be straight with you 100% as always. In life, I really struggle to reflect. It's very hard. Um, as a business owner, I'm excellent at reflecting. And I'll tell you why it's really hard for me personally as the human being that I am, not the entrepreneur that I am. It's really hard to face the obstacles that you have in your life with a with objectivity, without bias. Especially so when you work with your wife as I do, she's my business partner, and we're trying to maximize our human relationship, our, our husband and wife relationship, and our business relationship, as well as our relationships with ourselves. There's so many parts to it. I'm just being straight. 
that it's just easier for me sometimes to just avoid it. It's just easier to watch Netflix, it's just easier to watch Game of Thrones. It's just easier to sit in the sun and think of nothing than it is to really reflect on my own human self. I'm being real because I want to express that I'm a human being also, right? Like I might be a really, really good entrepreneur and I'm really proud of what I've done, but I still struggle with certain things in my life, right? Like I want to work out every single day and I still struggle to do that. Why is that the case? Is that because Dax say I don't really discipline myself? 100% dude, 100%, that's it. That's just the reality of what it takes. That's what it is. But do I want to face that fact every month? No, I don't. But if I don't, then also I can't bitch about it, which I don't, I, I don't bitch about it. But I'm telling you, frankly, it's hard. It's really hard to reflect on these human systems, but that's why I'm also coaching it. A lot of coaches, at least what I do, I'm coaching myself as just as much as I'm coaching anyone else because that's why I'm so good at it because I've been there. I get it. I understand it because I'm there either right now or I've been there before and I've overcome it. On the business side, how I've become so, so, so good at it is I've removed all the fear from it. And you saw Daxi when we were there on Saturday night, what I did with that guy who's talking mm -hmm. about fear. I won't accept fear. I hope um, someone documented that because like that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have it live on my Facebook page. We can watch it. Um I, I really don't want fear to be in my life anymore. I'm gonna tell you guys a really funny story that will really resonate with you on how it fits in my business. So when I was a kid, I used to be terrified of butterflies. Yeah, bro. Butter what dude? Right? <laughs> Butterflies. So let me kind of express why. I'm born and born and raised in Florida, right? So flying bugs are very common, and bees were like the thing I was really, really scared of. So bees just led me to becoming scared of the noise, the zzz noise, which meant me to be scared of mosquitoes and moths and butterflies, even though they're absolutely gorgeous and beautiful animals, right? Now this this got even this got even funnier, Daxi. So my brothers, I'm the youngest of three. My brothers knew I was scared of butterflies. I'm maybe 10 years old and they brought me to what's called Butterfly World, which is just a place where you feed literally- I used to live like across the street, dude. You know. I, I used to work there. It's funny. <laughs> That's so funny. You know, <laughs> you know you the, the Lord Keith little section? Exactly. Yeah, I used to feed them the mango juice. It's funny. Exactly. So my brothers brought me there as a joke. Um, and I think honestly, they, they told me we we're gonna go see birds and then they brought me to the butterfly portion. And I, I just was a cat catatonic. Like, freaking out and there's this thing in psychology called flooding where you have a fear and you get flooded by that fear whether it's like i'm scared of scorpions and you get just a bunch of scorpions in front of you like the fear will eventually drain away from you when you recognize there's nothing to be fearful of at 10 years old it's a lot harder because your logistical brain is not working you're just in full crocodile brain totally scared out of your mind but as i grew up and grew up to an adult you know Obviously, I'm not scared of butterflies anymore, but the idea behind that was recognizing that fear is a, is a human emotion that's based in our heart of hearts, like our pit. And I, I use this in another um, interview I did, but like when you get pulled, pulled over by a cop or a cop pulls behind you, you get that pit in your stomach, right, Daxi? Right now, in this moment, you cannot sub, you not consciously create that feeling. You can't feel it. But if you got into your car right now and sped down the highway and a cop pulled behind you, it will happen. How does that happen, right? What I wanna do is try to overcome these things. I feel like fear is one of those things that we can, we can try to overcome it. It's not just one of the heart dropping things. You can make it happen, you can overcome it. So I come down to the baseline from ambiguity to clarity. What was the fear from butterflies? I don't like flying bugs. What do they do? They don't do anything to you. Are they beautiful? Yeah, they're beautiful. And they also help plants like grow in Florida. Great, I love butterflies now. Like, they're beautiful. I love monarch. They're gorgeous animals. They're, they're amazing. And they do the caterpillar thing. It's incredible, right? Like that's amazing. So when that happened to me, like as I grew up and, and started overcoming it and you know, Daxi as a kid, like everyone in high school would be making fun of me for that. They used to put butterflies in my locker, like straight up, bro. Like this was hardcore back in the day. So now <laughs> hardcore butterflies in my locker, <laughs> hardcore butterflies, also crickets, which were like killing me guys. Um, so, I ended up recognizing like fear comes down to ambiguity and not really understanding what the fear is. So everything that I do is written down very, very clearly. When we were we were gonna have this podcast yesterday and I'm like, oh shit, I didn't have it on the calendar. And I told you that everything I do is on the calendar. So I have clarity on everything that I do, everything that I reflect on. So every single week, um, I have all my calendar items and every every single week at the end of the day, last thing I do on a Friday is I reflect on that week and I identify how much time I spent on certain tasks in my business, on the business and on myself. 
on myself is the one thing that I try to do um, reflecting on me, but I struggle with it. Like I've said, just being very frank and honest. Um, it's just easier not to deal with it, honestly, because the business is like my other version of me. Not a good excuse at all. I'm just being very real because that's the only way people can understand it. If I come on here and pretend that everything is roses and daisies, no one's going to ever learn from anything. So that's not who I am. So I reflect every single week. I sit down and I take time to go through time optimization. Like how did I spend my time? How did I prioritize my time? And what did I not get done versus did get done on my tasks and to do's? Every single week I do that. Every month I review the four weeks that I did um, and then my overarching feelings about that month and then the main things I need to implement for the following month by reviewing my KPIs and my goals. The goals are here in my, bo my uh, board always right over there. Um, and I just make sure that I'm always reflecting on that. So I do it at least once a week for 30 minutes and then once a month usually for an hour. Uh, and then once a quarter I do that success member diagram that I was telling you about uh, just so that we can make fulfillment even better because uh, it's critically important. So that's how I reflect. Um, it's definitely not a perfect science, but it's made me a lot more effective in my life, uh, especially as an entrepreneur. Yeah, that reminds me of, uh, I read in the, it was like a Stoic book, Stoic philosophy, um, how they like reflect at the end of every day, like what I did good, what I did bad, what how I can improve. Dude, the Stoic philosophy is like everything that I try to live by. I listen to a podcast called The Daily Stoic. It's a great podcast. Oh, is that Ryan Holiday or? I'm not sure who it is. It's three minutes long every single day. I listen to it. Um, it's just Those really are my favorite books of all time, like Seneca and Seneca. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, stoicism is a beautiful thing, um, and it's a really good thing for especially for entrepreneurs. Like, how do you? Hand this is what I was talking about the other day. Like, how do you handle um, your mindset when everything around you is chaotic? Like, how do you do that? That's what stoicism is all about. It's about focusing on what you control, your actions over your outcomes, right? And this is why I love philosophy and why I love psychology and and why I naturally am good at sales and why I came into coaching because it's so funny, you know, someone asked me recently, like, Alex, why didn't you go into become a psychologist? And it's like, I am a psychologist in a different way. I'm a business psychologist, right? Like I help people with their business mindset. I'm not, you know, uh, uh, gonna, you know, uh, tell them what medication to use or anything like that, but it, it's similar. It's, it's super I unique like the, how, it's weird. I, how I kind of mold it. Like the best psychologists are the ones who are like just solving the problem, not really focused on like being in the field, or whatever. Um, pretty interesting. Um, so before we wrap up here, I kind of want to dive into um, your because I, I think it's super fascinating and it's super important. And I know it's changed my life. And I feel like I don't even have this to the extent that you probably teach it or do it is tracking your numbers. Mm. Um, what are like your key things that you personally track that bring you the most results? everything forever ever so here's here's some of the specific things let's let's break them down into formats okay so the three core tenets of your business prospecting sales fulfillment prospecting is leads coming in sales is converting those leads to clients and fulfillment is servicing those clients and what you sold them then there's the the underlying process which is productivity being efficient and getting all those things done which is basically the gas for that machine so that's really important. Now, the thing that you have to do, do is have KPIs for each piece and a goal for each piece. So the goal is what how you create the KPI. So for example, let's just use uh, sales as one of the KPIs. So we wanna have $10,000 in revenue. We need to sell 10 clients at $1,000. If you believe you close your percentages at 50%, then you need to have 20 sales calls, right? If you need to have 20 sales calls to get 10 clients to $10,000 in revenue, how many leads do you need to get to 20 sales calls? If you convert 20% of your leads to sales calls, you need 100 total leads. Now you've got your KPIs. Now you reflect on that at the end of the month. It doesn't matter if you're way off. Obviously, you're going to be off in the first time you do it, but that's how you then optimize it for the next month. So I reached out to, let's say, 100 leads. I only got 10 sales calls and I only closed two of them. Okay, no worries. You were off on your numbers. Now let's move it backwards for the next month. So it's actually a 20% close rate that I have. I still want to get to 10,000. I need eight more sales. Now I only add an X percentage on converting them to, now you work it backwards. These are the keys for every piece of your business. And I do this consistently. 
it might seem tedious and, and annoying, but it's not. It's really important. These are the systems that I give away in Prospecting on Demand Elite, my mentorship program, to help people become more efficient with their human systems and business systems for tracking specifically, because that's the key to long-term success. So that's what I do for sales specifically. Anyone that I hire, for example, I hired a lead nurturer yesterday, and I paid her a flat rate, and then I gave her KPIs. I said, you have to reach out to at least 100 leads this month. You have to bring me at least 10 sales calls this month, and I need to close at least three for us to continue. These are our KPIs built from expectations and numbers that we identified, then we can review them at the end of the month. So really tracking and honing in your KPIs specifically for each core tenant of the business is critical. The last one I'll talk about is your CEO model, like being a freelancer versus being a CEO. I always identify how much time I wanna spend per week inside my business and how much I wanna spend on my business. Here's an example. Doing a podcast or an hour with Daxi is on my business because this could be lead generation. Anyone that watches it might end up wanting to work with me. Fantastic. No worries. If it's not, it will be on Google. You, there's portions and reasons behind this other than, of course, just wanting to help and wanting to chat with you, right? But that would be something I'd put in on my business. If I have an hour to put to work on my business and then later today I'm working on a new SOP for my clients, that's also on my business. If I have a one hour call with my client to talk to them about something they're doing, that's in my business. How am I spending my time is very, very important because that's the most valuable resource I have. It's a lot more valuable than my money, right? A lot more valuable. So if I want to utilize my time appropriately, I need to have KPIs on how I'm spending my time. This is probably the most difficult thing to track uh, if you use a calendar, it becomes a lot more effective. The way that I specifically do it is I have my VA on Friday. Um, it's actually, yeah, on Friday, uh, the end of the day, they will put in all the numbers uh, for me and the right on the business, in the business and unsure. And then I'll look at the unsure uh, and then format it for them. And then I'll look back at the last weeks and identify how I'm spending my time. And sometimes, as you can imagine, the numbers drastically differ. And I'm trying to hit a medium, right? Or an average, if you want to call it and figure out where did that, what just happened? Sometimes it's out of my control. For example, spending four hours going to an event on a Saturday, that's out of my control, right? Like that, that that's gonna be on the business and, and doing some things that maybe I didn't anticipate, no big deal, right? But it allows you to at least have clarity on where you're at rather than ambiguity. That's the problem. Ambiguity is the crusher of human beings in general. That is amazing. And does she like look at like a full day or just a work day or? Full, uh, no, just work day. So from basically, I usually work from like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. normally, um, but some days like it's out of my control. Like some days I work earlier or sometimes I work later. Some days I don't work at all, just depending on where we're at. But that's the reason I'm an entrepreneur. So I get to choose my time. Gotcha. Well, dude, I really love your mindset. Like, you know, the, the ambiguity and, and the clarity and thinking of like business as a formula, you know, like knowing what inputs you need for this output you want. Yes. Um, it's really awesome. So dude, uh, while we wrap up here, is there anything you want to share with people if they want to follow you or join any of your programs? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you need help, please feel free to reach out to me. You can friend me on Facebook. Absolutely. Um, if you need help with prospecting, I'd probably shoot this one down below, which would be prospectingondemand.com slash PPS. That is my perfect prospecting system. Um, if you haven't read, if you already read that, you can go to the same website slash PIAB, which is my prospecting in a box. Ultimately, if you utilize anything I provide to you on the trainings, let me know if you get some sales, I'm really happy for you. If you want to work with me, let me know as well. We can talk about prospecting on demand or prospecting on demand elite, which is my mentorship program. Uh, specifically want to work with people that are in the agency agency space, trying to scale to $10,000 recurring revenue, have one or two clients already, but need to really scale it up to become a CEO. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to help you. Awesome, dude. Awesome. I love the, I love sales. Boom. In all caps, they're excited. Uh, I'm gonna drop the link right now in the chat. Oh, that's John Albert Ferguson. He's awesome. We're working. He, uh, you should probably, he should, you should probably uh, get on his podcast, Legendary Closer Radio. He's like, I've learned a lot from him. Dope. Uh, yeah, I think he worked for Robert Kiyosaki in his team. Nice. Um, cool. Alex is the best. Um, sweet. That's from Karen. Dude, thanks so much for hopping on here. Uh, we got like seven viewers now, guys. Why are you coming all now? Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll have this on the po on the podcast as well, so you guys can listen to everything uh, Alex dropped. Uh, really, really informative, dude. Thanks so much. Um, if you guys are in the replay, give me hashtag replay, and we'll catch you guys later. Peace out. See ya.